Good evening, everybody. On behalf of Council for Social Development, India International Center, Anthropological Survey of India, and Sage India Private Limited, I welcome you all to this fourth Social Change Golden Jubilee Lecture. Uh, we started this lecture uh, four years back we, when we completed the Golden Jubilee of Social Change Journal, though this is not the Golden Jubilee year this year. Uh, so this is our second most important thing to say because we have been having Durga Vai Deshmukh Memorial Lecture for a long time, uh, that is 33 or 34th year now, uh, in memory of our uh, founder Durga Vai Deshmukh, uh, who was a direct uh, disciple of Mahatma Gandhi. And so you would expect that uh, Mahatma Gandhi's thoughts also inspire our activities. So we thought of Antodaya, uh, meaning, you know, taking care of the last person in the society, taking, uh, wiping the tears of the poorest person of the country or the world, that guides our activities. Uh, and seeking a just, equitable and responsible society is our motto. Uh, in pursuit of that, we work on issues that relate to the marginalized sections of the community. And that can involve Dalits, that can involve tribals, that can involve uh, farmers, and of course, what else that can involve women, more importantly, though uh, they are half of the society, but still they are marginalized. And this incidentally have been a uh, very important part of this series of our lecture. And in this lecture also, we got uh, gender uh, uh, presence and representation is the topic of today. And to deliver this lecture, we have an eminent feminist economist who is known worldwide, Professor Vina Agarwal. Uh, I will not talk much more and I will now request uh, Professor Riyaj Ahmed, who is the editor of Social Change, to take over the discussion. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Nitinand. Uh, I am grateful to all these participants uh, right now, 137 or 138, uh, who have taken out time to uh, listen to one of the most uh, outstanding scholars of our times, Professor Veena Agarwal, on gender presence and uh, representation. As Professor Nitinand has said, that this is the fourth social change Golden Jubilee lecture. Uh, I'm here basically to introduce Professor uh, Bina Agarwal. But before uh, talking about Professor Bina Agarwal, let me very briefly uh, say a few words, a few lines about uh, our journal Social Change. And this is basically for the uninitiated. I'm sure that most of the participants know, already know about Social Change. Uh, inspired by the vision of CSD founders, Social Change was launched in 1971 to showcase quality research on the social dynamics of growth. The journal's success is the result of over 50 years of untiring efforts put in by many, CSD's office bearers, faculty and staff, the journal's editorial teams, advisory board members and publishers, and its contributors, external referees and subscribers. We, associated with social change now, thank them all. The story of social change journey will not be complete, will be incomplete if we miss an incident of historic importance that took place about 15 years ago. An institution builder in his own right, CSD President Professor Muchkun Dube convinced another institution builder, Professor Maranjan Mohanty, first to join CSD and then to take over as editor social change. The rest is history. Both these gentlemen, with support from others inside and outside CSD, engaged in collective productive thinking, thus shaping and implementing ideas leading to fresh initiatives and collaborations, which in turn further enriched the CSD and social change stories. It was only then that Sage too walked in as our publishers. Years later, Professor Vinay Srivastava also joined as another editor. Professor Srivastava's untimely loss 
shocked everybody at CSD and social change. But his contribution to the process of collective productive thinking continues to inspire us. Let me cite two recent outcomes of this collective productive thinking. A couple of years ago, it was planned that social change's golden jubilee be celebrated by bringing out a six volume series showcasing thematic collection of key articles published in social change since its inception. Professor Mahindra Mahanti agreed to be the series editor. Published by Sage, this series known as Social Change in Contemporary India will be released next month. Second, the Social Change Golden Jubilee lecture was planned. This lecture is actually being held annually since 2019 with gracious support from the Council for Social Development, India International Center, Sage Publications, and Anthropological Survey of India. We are grateful to all of them for their support and hope our collaboration continues in future. Next year onwards, the event will be known as Social Change Annual Lecture. Gopal Guru, Professor and Editor, Economic and Political Weekly. Uma Chakravarti, Professor and Feminist Historian. And G.N. Devi, Professor and Editor-in-Chief, People's Linguistic Survey of India, have been previous speakers. And as we know, another distinguished academic, Professor Bina Garwal, joins this illustrious list today. In introducing Professor Agarwal, the sheer richness of her stunning achievements leaves me baffled as to where to start. On seeing her CV, a line from an Urdu couplet came to mind. Kahan se chhedu fasana, kahan tamam karu? Where do I begin the story? Where do I end? But given time constraints, I'll confine myself to the minimum. Professor Agarwal is Professor of Development Economics and Environment at the University of Manchester, UK, which she joined in late 2012. She was earlier Director and Professor at the Institute of Economic Growth, University of Delhi. She has been President of International Society for Ecological Economics, President of International Association for Feminist Economics, and Vice President of the International Economic Association. She was the first woman from the Global South to hold these positions. She has also held distinguished positions at major universities, including at Harvard, Princeton, Minnesota, and Cambridge. Professor Agarwal is a prolific writer with over 100 academic papers and 13 books. She brings to her work insights from both theory and field experience. She pioneered the issue of women's rights, women's land rights in her prize winning book, A Field of One's Own, placing the issue centrally on the agenda of governments, NGOs, and international agencies. Women's land rights is now a key target in Sustainable Development Goal 5. Her recent books include Gender and Green Governance, Gender Challenges, which is a three volume compendium of her selected papers and gender inequality in developing economies translated into Italian. The famous political scientist, James Scott from Yale University endorsed her gender challenges with these words. I quote, no one in this time, no one in this last generation has contributed more to the understanding of rural society than Bina Agarwal. With lucidity, originality, and an insistence on both empirical data and experienced life worlds of her subjects, Agarwal takes place, takes her place with the likes of A.V. Chernov, Mark Bloch, and Esther, Esther Bozra. Professor Agarwal is not only a brilliant academic, but also a keen policy advocate. 
you will find her inputs in many of India's five-year plans. In 2005, she led a successful civil society campaign for amending the Hindu Succession Act to make it gender equal. Professor Agarwal works at, across disciplines, economics, law, political science, anthropology. In fact, she was invited to teach inheritance law by the New York University School of Law, although she's entirely self-taught in this discipline. Her research themes are also unusually diverse. Using the lens of political economy and gender, she has written extensively on land and livelihoods, environmental change, bargaining and gender relations, poverty and inequality, agriculture, and most recently, group farming in India and Europe, on which she is now writing a book. She also writes for newspapers. In recognition of her academic achievements, she has received numerous awards since her students' days. This includes several book prizes, a Padma Shri, the Leontief Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought, the Malcolm Adisatia Award for Distinguished Contribution <clears throat> to Development Studies, the Louis Malassis International Scientist Prize for an Outstanding Career in Agricultural Development, and the International Balzan Prize 2017 for challenging established premises in economics and the social sciences by using an innovative gender perspective. The Balzan is one of Europe's biggest prizes, and she is only the second woman from the Global South to win it since its inception in 1961. Professor Gaval was also awarded the Order of Agricultural Merit by the French government and holds honorary doctorates from the University of Antwerp in Belgium and the Institute of Social Studies at The Hague. In 2021, she was elected an honorary fellow of Murray Edwards College, Cambridge University, and a, and a life fellow of the International Economic Association. I know that, that a lot more can be said, but in the interest of time, I would probably uh, stop at that. But to invite such an eminent person to speak, we need another eminent person. Another eminent person, a distinguished man with many publications, former diplomat, former foreign secretary, former JNU professor, CSD president, and chair of this event. Who else but Professor Mutkun Dube? May I request Professor Dube to invite Professor Garwal to deliver her lecture. Over to Professor Dube, please. Thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Riyaz Ahmad, I have now the proud privilege of uh, requesting uh, uh, Professor uh, Bina Agrawal to deliver the Social Change Golden Jubilee Lecture. This will be the fourth in the series of these lectures. So you have the floor, madam. Thank you, um, uh, Professor um, Mujkund Dube. I'm really greatly honored to have been asked by you to deliver this Social Change Golden Jubilee Lecture. Uh, and Professor Ahmed, um, thank you for those really over generous um, words, your very warm and very poetic, if I may say, introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you. And now this, uh, this lecture celebrates uh, 50 years of this excellent journal, Social Change. It's a physical form I've seen change over time. It's published by SAGE and is housed uh, in the Council for Social Development, CSD. And I have a very old connection with CSD uh, where I did my first job in the 70s. I had just returned to Delhi after completing the economic tripos at Cambridge, and I was unsure about returning to the UK for a further degree at Oxford where I had admission. So I happened to meet uh, the then CSD director, Dr. Pradipta Roy, who offered me a job to work on the planning commission project on growth centers. So I worked with CSD for about a year and a half before enlisting for a PhD at the Delhi School of Economics. So I have very fond memories of my time at CSD. 
Um, and and so this lecture, being asked to give this lecture, has a particular, uh, particularly emotional meaning for me. Now, before starting my lecture, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, involved, uh, all those that you you um, see here on the screen, Professor Dube, Professor Nandi, Professor <clears throat> Ahmed, Professor Mohanty, Dr. Kalra. And also those who work behind the scenes from the CSD, from SAGE and the uh, Indian International Center. And in particular, um, Manika Chopra and Archana Jha, who worked tirelessly to help design and promote this event. Um, so I, I'm really grateful to all of you. Uh, as was said, I will be speaking on uh, gender uh, presence and representation. It's a topic on which I'd first started uh, researching in depth in uh, 2010 when I uh, was working on my book, Gender and Green Governance, and I followed developments uh, since. So let me um, first put on, uh, share my screen and the PPT. So you can um, all see the um, see the screen. Now, um, as you can uh, see, uh, this I'll come back to this picture, which some of you may know. And at the bottom are all the people who sponsored uh, this talk today. Now, women's um, history of governance in India is marked more by an absence than by presence. And if we leave aside, for instance, the, the uh, history of queens and consorts, in fact, in the late 19th, early 20th century, women's um, presence in the everyday institutions uh, of governance uh, was a rarity. And women were largely absent, in fact, even in historical writings on governance, apart from accounts of women's struggle for sufferance and a place in the legislature from the 1920s. Now, there is um, a little on women's presence in customary institutions of village decision making, such as caste and tribal councils, gram sabhas, village courts, and so on. And the limited information um, uh, I could find uh, was through gleaning dozens of ethnographies and colonial accounts, uh, especially 30 volumes of castes and tribes in India. Now, these show uh, that women were almost entirely excluded from caste and tribal councils. And there were some rare exceptions, say, among the Santals in East India or among the Garus in Meghalaya. But even the pre-independent statutory uh, village councils set up in the 1920s made no space for women. Now, this change, uh, this changed somewhat um, with independence, uh, of course, uh, when uh, in the 1950s, as part of decentralized governance, the Central Council of Local govern Government recommended that block panchayats um, should co-opt uh, two women to work among women and children. And there were several government committees subsequently, such as the Balwant Ray Mehta and the Santa Ram Committee, Santa Nam Committee, who recommended that at least two women should be included, since one woman would feel isolated. Now, several states then enacted laws to include two token women. In fact, policy directives requiring at least, at least two women in local institutions of governance became the norm, although many ignored even um, this in practice. Now, this situation uh, changed dramatically in 1993 when the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments reserved one third seats for women uh, in the Panchayati Raj inst uh, institutions and municipalities, uh, with seats for uh, SC and ST uh, women within the one third. Also, one third of all constituencies in the state would have women heads of uh, village councils, Pradhans. So, as a result, at the start, over a million um, women, uh, village women, including something like 86,000 chairs and vice chairs were elected with statutory powers. Importantly, the female Pradhan, uh, Pradhans of the village councils were randomly assigned to be rotated every five years. Now this random assignment created uh, what economists today call a natural experiment. And this has provided, of course, the basis of a very rich body of studies in recent years by economists. 
But in most non-formal institutions of governance, such as uh, forest uh, protection committees, the norm of two token women continued for decades. Women's entry into legislatures was both in a way easier and more difficult than their entry into panchayats. Now, I don't have the time to trace the complex uh, history uh, of this, and it is detailed in my book, Gender and Green Governance, but I'll highlight uh, some points. In the 1920s, a range of emergent um, women's organizations raised the demand for women's right to vote and to stand for elections. Women's growing visibility in the anti-colonial struggle, of course, also helped. And they did gain restricted entry into provincial councils and uh, federal legislatures pre-independence. Now, although women's numbers were small, they were symbolically important insofar as women were recognized as a constituency. But based on the idea that their lives and interests were so different from men's that they needed separate representation, especially to deal with so-called women's issues, such as family and child welfare. Now, this, uh, this hyphenation um, of women and children has unfortunately persisted uh, within policy um, uh, making circles, even as women's numbers in legislatures and parliament uh, remain small. So here is a, um, as you can see, is a picture of uh, some of the pre-independence uh, women's organizations, um, the All India Women's Conference, uh, the Women's India Association and the National Council of Women in India, um, who uh, struggled hard um, for uh, women's rights in that period. So what is the situation today? Now, if you look at this graph, um, we note uh, that from 1951 um, onwards, there is a broad upward trend uh, from uh, something like 4.5% women MPs in the first Lok Sabha, the lower house in 1951 to 14.4% in 2019, which is uh, this, uh, this graph ends earlier. This is, uh, and the 2019 figure is here. Now this, uh, the situation, so as you can see, despite the growth, the situation has, it still leaves us at 14.4 um, or 5% uh, in 2019. That's the situation in the Rajya Sabha is even more dismal because the highest percentage reached in 1952 was, um, the highest percentage was um, uh, in 1952 and uh, it was 12.7 percent earlier, and then it became in 2014. Um, it was 12.7 percent. 2014, sorry, uh, it was 6.9 in 52, and it is 10.2 uh, in 2000. In state legislatures today, the percentages range from 13.6 in West Bengal to zero, as you can see here in Meghalaya and Nagaland. And even in matrilineal um, Meghalaya, um, the Mizoram in Nagaland is zero, but even you know, Meghalaya, which we know is predominantly matrilineal, the figures are only 5%. Now, clearly these figures show a vast gap between where we are now and the 33% reservation that women's groups have been lobbying for in parliament. In fact, even globally, studies show that less than 19% of legislators are women, 22% in countries with quotas and 13% without quotas. So why do the, uh, these uh, numbers matter? To begin with, uh, the presence of other women can help women overcome their reticence and participate more effectively in public forums. Now, interestingly, even in the 1990s, this was reported uh, for US legislators that women were often reticent in speaking up. But it is, uh, of course, not surprising in India, especially if you look at village sabhas. So if you look at this picture, it's a meeting in Gujarat um, with the token two women in the early 2000s. The question is, can you even spot the women? And as uh, many village uh, women in Gujarat told me, I've done quite a lot of field work there, Men don't stop us from speaking, but they do all the talking. And also that it helps us to have more women because women will not be dominated or feel shy. After all, if there's only one woman and 10 men, how will she speak? So a participation in fact, in a public forum is a complex concept. 
which can range from, I argue, uh, nominal to empowered. So if you look at this typology, in an, and, and this is the typology I had created a while ago, in any institution, simply being a member of a group, uh, we would say is nominal participation. Now you can move from there to so let's say passive participation where you listen, uh, but you don't speak to active um, participation where you might give your views. But to count as empowered and effective participation, you should be able to influence decisions at least some of the time. So what would it take to feel empowered and to participate effectively in public forums for women? For a start, one could argue you need a critical mass of women. Now we know that critical mass is a term uh, which is borrowed from physics, but it's been used now quite uh, commonly by social scientists. So what would constitute a, a, a critical mass? Now there's no universal agreement on this and estimates can range from 15 to 40% or more. Um, one of the earliest who talked about this was Ross Cantor in her book, 90, 1977 book, Men and Women of the Corporation. And she argues that in industrial corporations, we need 40 to 50% women for effectiveness and 15% would be merely a token. Other scholars mention 15% uh, or more um, to 35% in Western legislatures. Meanwhile, globally, as we know, one third has become the magic figure in lobbying for gender quotas, but whether that's parliament or village councils. So you'll ask, well, where did this figure come from? It was first proposed in my, my understanding by Drude uh, Dellerup, a Danish sociologist who observed in the 1980s uh, that when the proportion of women in the Scandinavian parliament increased from a small minority to one third, the culture of interaction became less aggressive. The timings of crucial meetings took account of women's uh, um, uh, childcare responsibilities and so on. And later several authors proposed a range of figures, but in most cases, uh, these were guesstimates and not necessarily empirically tested for critical mass. Now I did try and measure critical mass in my study on community forestry in India, India and Nepal. And, um, and I found that 25 to 33% was indeed the critical percentage. Groups with one third women in the executive committees of forest management groups were significantly more likely to attend meetings, to speak up at meetings and to hold leadership positions. But of course, these, uh, these uh, percentages can vary by country and context and there is need to ha have much wider uh, measurements. Now, several countries, uh, meanwhile, uh, have reserved uh, one third uh, or more seats in village councils, it's not just in India, but also in our neighboring countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh. Now, this is a big shift from the 1940s when panchayats had no women and the 1960s when they had a mere two women. In India, in India today, all panchayats have one third women members. Some states have moved to 50%. And also if you look at this figure, and I know it's a bit small, um, but um, if you count that, you find that in 14 states in 2017, over 50% of village council heads, the Pradhans were women. So why is women's presence uh, important in institutions of governance? Now, conceptually, a wide range of arguments can and have been made. Of course, the, uh, the most Im the primary argument is equality and voice. Uh, in a democratic society, equality and voice has intrinsic worth. And the inclusion of a diversity of people is important, and especially of those who are socially disadvantaged by gender, caste, race, and so on. But beyond equality, it is argued uh, that women's presence will improve uh, the process of governance by changing group dynamics. Um, so uh, for instance, uh, many uh, um, assert that women's presence can transform the culture and values of public bodies. Women are perceived to be more cooperative, less corrupt. And many also see them as likely to bring more caring, sharing and moral values to the public domain and encourage less aggressive behavior. That I think we can all agree on if we see today's parliament in India. Thirdly, it is argued that women will have different policy priorities from men and will cater more to women's interests. 
Now you will recall the 1920s argument uh, I had uh, shared with you to support Indian women's entry into legislatures. It had been said that women's lives and interests are so different from men's that they need separate representation. In fact, studies of legislatures of some Western democracies do show that women give much more priority than their male colleagues to laws that promote women's equality and, uh, and family welfare, bills for health, education, childcare, and so on. And fourthly, it's argued that women leaders can have an impact on gender dynamics. When women participate in public decision making, it can empower both the representatives and the women they represent. The representatives can become more self-confident in speaking in public, much more effective, and they can also serve as role models. Now, this conceptualization of the impact of women's presence is based partly on assumptions and partly on descriptive evidence from Western legislatures. So what is the evidence for India? Now, the strongest evidence for India comes from studies um, by a small group of economists. And um, although there are also valuable studies by other social scientists, the body of evidence that I will refer to is important since it uses rigorous methodology, is peer reviewed, often published in major journals and covers both longitudinal and cross-sectional analysis. So you could ask, well, why are economists even interested in what is normally the domain of political scientists? Well, first, because economists are interested in policy making and hence in policy makers, be they village pradhans or legislators. Second, the random allocation of reserve seats for village pradhans in India creates, as I mentioned, a natural experiment, which can help establish causation without conducting actual experiments such as through randomized control trials. In fact, to my knowledge, the first use of the village pradhan data as a natural experiment was around 2000 by Esther Dufflow and Chattopadhyay. And as you know, um, Dufflow co-shared the 2019 Nobel Prize in Economics uh, for actual experiments, but has also used natural experiments and co-authored several of the papers I will refer to. What I'll do is I'll only provide an illustration uh, and not a coverage of all studies. Um, and I'll try and separate out the results for state legislators from that of village bodies. So begin with, let's, uh, let's consider the question of participation, which is important for democratic functioning. Now, there are two aspects of this. First, the ability of women leaders to themselves participate effectively. And secondly, the ability of village women to participate in meeting, meetings led by women leaders. So the first relates to critical mass and can be measured from state legislators and my community forestry data as an example. The second relates to women Pradhan data. Now, several studies, both from single states and several states, find that women legislators participate rather little in, in assembly, uh, assembly debates due to their low numbers, which don't make up a critical mass. Now, some uh, early studies also found that women MPs rarely introduced bills or participated in parliamentary debates. So, for example, I came across this study which had looked at the 8th Lok Sabha, 1985 to 89, and female MPs who constituted only 8% of MPs spoke up in less than five um, of short duration discussions and less than 10 of the longer duration ones. Usually the same women spoke and none raised issues specifically concerning women. In my own study on community forestry executive committees in the villages of Gujarat and Nepal, uh, however, I could test for critical mass, and I found that executive committee women were significantly more likely to attend meetings, speak up at them, and serve in leadership positions if they constituted um, around between 25 to 33 percent or more of the EC. Now, the second type of participation effect, as I had said, was where the women pradhans is a woman. And here we, we, it is found in several studies, and you can see I've, I've, um, I've uh, put in several studies here, um, and that um, village women are more likely to speak up in Gram Sabha meetings. And they also find that women Pradhans um, 
they you know they they that women pr pradhans are more socially approachable than male pradhans now um, it is noticeable of course that it's notable of course that village councils already have one third village uh, women councillors as regular members and and this no doubt empowers the women pradhan now this aspect perhaps needs more attention when examining the impact of uh, women pradhans but it is not possible to empirically mention it since all the um, all panchayats have at least one third women the uh, the second uh, is that um, in, in more women in governance is found indeed to reduce corruption now a study of 4265 Four to six five state assembly constituencies over two decades, 1992 to 2012, found that the rate at which women MLAs accumulated assets was 10 percentage points lower per annum than male MLAs. Similarly, for village um, uh, village councils, um, a study for 11 states found that villagers in female pradhan villages were less likely to have paid a bribe. than in male pradhan villages now these these are uh, these studies um, are very rigorously uh, done and so we have we can have confidence in these results third if you look at policy and this is especially value well uh, valuable evidence do um, uh, do women uh, in public office make different policies from men and here um at first let's look at the state leg studies for state legislatures um and we find that uh, in in all these studies you find that there is a significant and positive uh, difference um, when women are there in terms of policy priorities and outcomes so there is the uh, there is a recent study by baskaran and several authors uh, who uh, look at 4265 state assembly constituencies over 6, 1992 2012 they were the ones who also did the corruption study found that women legislators raised economic performance annual gdp growth in their constituencies by about 1.8% uh, 8 percentage points per year more than male legislators now the authors link this to the earlier cited finding that women legislators are less likely to be criminal or corrupt and this study also found that while male and female legislators were equally likely to negotiate for major road major federal road building projects women were much more likely to oversee completion so both these aspects point to better policy outcomes then there are a range of studies which find that female legislators favor investments in health and education more than male legislators and um, one of these uh, studies also found that uh, a 10% increase in uh, women women's representation leads to 2.1% reduction in neonatal and natal um, uh, mortality so these are uh, uh, further fine tuning of the results now in village councils that was uh, legislators in village councils also women pradhans are found in several studies to prioritize drinking water roads sanitation irrigation and schools and these findings are much more widely known um, and um, and in village uh, community forestry this is my own research um, i found that forest outcomes was significantly better with the executive committees had um a higher percentage of women and this is just a um, little picture of my uh, book and fourthly um uh, the impact of women's presence as leaders has an imp very important effect on village women's empowerment now a study for 17 states over the period 1985 to 2007 found that village women were much more likely to report violent crime against women where the pradhan was a woman even though there were no there was no overall deterioration in law and order and other studies find uh, that female pradhans serve as role models they also and interestingly they also enhance the educational aspirations of girls and their parents moreover women in decision making positions uh, demonstrate to male leaders especially if they've been you know not the first round or the second round that women are capable of functioning effectively in uh, public uh, policy uh, in 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 uh, public institution uh, uh, as leaders more generally public participation increases women's own capabilities and as a group of um, women in one gujarat village 
uh, told me, if we step out of the house, we become more aware, we become more vocal, we get more information, we gain more exposure, we get more respect. So broadly to summarize uh, the evidence on impact of female presence in public office, um, first it promotes uh, gender equality in governance and enhances uh, um, and empowers women, improves democratic functioning and inclusion. Second, it reduces corruption, increases economic growth and enhances efficiency in governance. Third, it prioritizes infrastructure on roads, health, education, drinking water, and sanitation. And fourth, there are, could be further effects such as reducing uh, neonatal mortality um, and increasing the aspirations of uh, women, uh, girls and, and parents. But then the key question is, how many of these results address women's specific interests? Now, infrastructure improvement, of course, brings overall benefits, including for women. So if we talk about piped water, sanitation, schools, they are of general interest from which women also gain. And on some counts, it can be argued, such as piped water, women gain more than men. But these are not specific to women. So roads, uh, one can argue, tend to benefit more since they travel more, although women can benefit if they work in road making. But then one can think of a range of gender specific issues which remain unaddressed, such as the gender job gap, gender wage gap, gender property land ownership gap, domestic violence, sexual harassment in travel and workspaces, digital gap, and so on. In other words, there appears to be little evidence that women representatives in India particularly represent women in a comprehensive way, although there could be uh, some, some aspects which we've seen. The question is, why don't they? Why not? And here I argue that there are both internal and external constraints. So internal constraints could be attitudes, like women don't see themselves as mandated to represent women. They have a discomfort with raising um, uh, issues which are seen as women's issues. There can uh, also be heterogeneity of interest. So people have multiple identities. Um, you can have differentiation by class, but also by caste and religion. Or you can lack engagement with women's groups to assess what the priorities are. Then there can be external constraints. So for, for instance, for women Pradhans, if you have a list of subjects that the state has identified, that can be restricted. And when I looked at it, the last time I looked at it, there were very few states which included women in development in those subjects. There can be limited funding because there is a lot of funding that is provided uh, at the panchayat level is tied uh, to pre-given projects. Similarly, for women legislators, uh, party decides the political party to which you belong decides priorities. And there are limitations, of course, of introducing private members uh, bills. But let's look at attitudes in particular. And there are a number of um, qualitative and other studies um, from which I've, I've drawn. These are just illustrative. So, so for instance, um, based on interviews, Wendy Singer uh, noted that many prominent women politicians eschewed the label of women politician, both during elections and in office. Then Shirin Rai, who's worked extensively on this, uh, based on detailed interviews with many women parliamentarians, noted that none saw herself as representing women or their particular interests. Typically, they felt bound by their party's agendas and priorities. Few had any stated links with autonomous women's organizations, although they may have known some feminist activists in a personal capacity. Village council and municipal councillors are also uh, have somewhat similar attitudes. So for instance, a study in Karnataka, which notes that women counselors felt that their bargaining power would be considerably reduced if they took up gender specific issues, which are not supported by other members or political functionaries. Or, and that gender interests were not an electoral issue in politics. So the representatives did not act for women. 
Similarly, uh, one of the rare studies on, on urban areas, uh, uh, which is Stephanie Lama Reval, uh, found that in Calcutta, then if you look at municipalities, uh, she notes that most women municipal council councillors did not want to advocate women's interests because they did not consider them, or they did not want to appear as if they considered them a major issue. So there are exceptions to this. There are all women panchayats in Maharashtra, which have been documented. There are some councillors in some states like Himachal Pradesh, where um, who are uh, who would be could be exceptions. But this is this is a broad uh, picture. So then the thing is that um, increasing women's presence in public office need not lead to a focus on women's issues. And here I want to um, uh, introduce two concepts which might prove useful. Firstly, what I call implicitly shared interests versus explicit recognition of interests. Where women implicitly share common interests, even numbers could be enough. So for instance, village women dependent, uh, are dependent on forests uh, for firewood and that's a common interest. Uh, and I found that this could be furthered in, 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 the, in the work I did um, uh, greatly. This, this was furthered simply by the power of numbers. But in most con contexts, an explicit recognition of common interests would be much more effective. And this brings me to the second concept, gender in itself and gender for itself. And many of you would be familiar with the Marxist um, distinction between class in itself and class for itself. It's not exactly identically that I use it, but it is somewhat similar. Now, gender in itself can simply mean a group of women as a descriptive category. But gender for itself means that women recognize their common interests and act collectively. For instance, women parliamentarians uh, came together across party lines for the women's reservation bill to seek one third seat, seats in parliament. And I've, uh, you can see this from this picture, you recognize many of them. Uh, they have <laughs> diverse ideologies. You have uh, Sushma Sorad there, you have uh, Brinda Karan. So you have women from a wide range of political spectrums who came together on the women's reservation bill, uh, which hasn't been passed, of course, yet. Now this could be seen as gender for itself. But for women as citizens, this would only raise female presence in parliament. It would not guarantee better representation of ordinary women's interests. For effectively representing ordinary women's interests, people like many of us, uh, myself and others, um, for that gender for itself among representatives needs to go beyond personal self-interest, in my view. Presence is not equal to representation. Now, conceptually, you could take two extreme positions with regard to representation. Um, one argument could be that, well, each person must be present in decision-making since none can be represented by another as no two people's experience is the same. The other view position could be, well, one person may easily stand for another as long as there is a congruity of political beliefs and ideals. Hence, if a set of ideas has wide prevalence, a person need not be present personally in decision-making for her interests to be represented. Now, clearly both extremes are, are untenable. We can't all represent ourselves and we need to be represented by someone. But that person must share not just our selected identity based on gender or caste, etc., but also care about our ideas and priorities. So can a common identity substitute for shared ideas? Now the demand for or the move towards quotas for women in legislatures or village councils assumes a shared gender identity, assumes that a shared gender identity also implies shared interests and shared ideas. In fact, we often assume a commonality of interests based on descriptive categories like gender, a caste, religion, and so on. But is this assumption valid? As we've seen, identities and ideas need not be congruent. So to effectively represent women's interests, ideas matter and not just presence. And as uh, <clears throat> the political scientist Anne Philip put it very well, and she reminds us that the biggest mistake is to set up ideas as the opposite of political presence or to worry exclusively about the people without giving a thought to their policies and ideas. Ideas 
in fact, can be the cement for establishing common cause despite material and cultural difference. Now that common cause one can submit can also be with men who can represent women's interests alongside. And there are many examples of this. I mean, if you look at the whole social reform uh, movements, 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, the anti-sati uh, movement, widow remarriage, inheritance law reform were led or, by, or were supported uh, by men. Similarly, one can argue that common cause can also help women align across hierarchical heterogeneity. And by hierarchical heterogeneity, I mean there are hierarchical differences, particularly of class and castes. Now, what would be the common cause? One could argue that there are shared needs, shared vulnerabilities, and shared social norms. So for example, at one level, you could say that poor and well-off women would have conflicting interests and needs, and quite rightly. But there can be contexts where women have common interests cutting across class differences. So for instance, as I said, in rural India, both poor and middle farmer women often fetch firewood and fodder. Women across classes face domestic violence. Conservative social norms and negative ideas about women's capabilities are also shared across classes. Moreover, a sense of fairness and justice towards the well-off can also bridge differences between women. In fact, economists have this term, which they say uh, <clears throat> inequality aversion. Now, um, another way forward, therefore, would be for women to forge alliances around strategic, strategic commonality of interests on specific counts. As in the 1980s, we had the anti-dowry movement um, uh, or the domestic, or domestic violence issues were taken up commonly. So shared ideas could bridge other divides. But civil society also needs to hold women and male representatives accountable to uphold women's interests and issues. So I've used the term here, I've just done a little a thing to say it, women, but also male representatives. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, the, so in this I've said, uh, I've done a little, a little schema where gender for itself group, gender progressive group, citizens can form strategic alliances, hold representatives accountable on women's issues, be those representatives of village council, state legislatures, or parliament. And third, um, to effectively represent women's interests, representatives, I would argue, must connect with civil society. This could be connections with women's movements, grassroots movements, autonomous rights groups, public intellectuals, uh, and so on. What is notable is that women legislators in countries that have proactively engaged with women's concerns have tended to be those with, with close links with women's movements. And cases in point uh, and are uh, the USA, South Africa, Australia, quite diverse contexts. So for instance, in the USA, Sue Carroll, she's a, she's a political scientist, found that many of the women state legislators that she interviewed in 2001 described themselves as feminists and had been members or had been members of women's organizations. They were part of women's caucuses or informal groups which also met across party lines. In South Africa, again, uh, the important role that women's organizations played in the anti-apartheid struggle and hence, um, uh, they, because of that, they commanded a great deal of bargaining power and it led the government to induct many women activists um, into government. And in turn, they helped establish institutional mechanisms with grassroots um, groups for promoting gender equality. In Australia in the 70s, uh, there's another example, uh, the support of women's organizations to the Labour Party election campaign led to many women being appointed to the government. And many of those appointed were working class, came from working class and, and they were especially mindful of the needs of poor women. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you could think of other examples. Now in India, there are a few examples, there could be more uh, that you could think of. Uh, the UPA1, for instance, passed two major women-specific acts in 2005, the Domestic Violence Act and the Hindu Succession Amendment Act, and both were promoted by civil society with support from uh, then uh, gender progressive MPs. You have women's wings of political parties which can connect with women's issues um, and who can connect 
over uh, issues with civil society. Again, that example, um, the best example I can think of is the 1980s, the Hate Virodi Chetnaman, but there, there would be other examples. Then you have the, the, the example of the Women's Manifesto, which was fielded by the Congress Party in 2019. Um, and that, again, I understand, was created after many consultations with non-party groups and individuals. In other words, a common feature of successful representation of women's interests has been uh, political rep representatives partnering with con or consulting with civil society and vice versa. So there's a two-way link between legislators or women leaders and gender progressive groups. And this can also make policymakers more accountable to women. So if you, if you think back of the 1930s and 40s, Indian women in politics had close links with women's organizations. But today, I, I, I'm struck that perhaps we don't have the same kind of engagement. For presence to lead to effective representation, this would need to change. So in conclusion, um, the presence of women in political and policy decision-making is important for equality, for justice, for democracy, policy priority and policy outcomes. But to be effective, they need a critical mass of presence. And presence alone does not guarantee that women representatives will represent women's interests, I would add comprehensively. Congruity of ideas and not just presence is essential for effectively representing diverse women's interests. Gender progressive civil society groups, I use the word gender progressive uh, uh, with great uh, the, uh, consciously uh, because they need not be only women's groups. So gender progressive civil society groups, which could be cross gender, need to hold all representatives accountable on women's issues. And to transform uh, mere presence to effective representation, representatives need to connect with grassroots groups, women's move, uh, movements, and public intellectuals. So then let me um, end with this image um, of, uh, on a positive note, that presence and representation is needed for a transformative agenda. And in the first picture, men speak, women listen. In the second, women speak and men listen. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Professor uh, Agarwal. Uh, I shall comment uh, uh, very briefly uh, on this uh, uh, very juridiet and stimulating lecture uh, yeah. in, a mo in, in a moment. Uh, but uh, for the present, uh, uh, we will move on to the uh, question and answer session. And uh, this would be conducted by uh, Professor Riaz Ahmad. And uh, I now give the floor to him. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dubey. Uh, there are quite a few questions and uh, without uh, uh, wasting any time, I think uh, we should uh, pick up a couple of questions first and probably others can be taken up in the second round. How do you want it to do? I mean, do you want to... Um, please, um, if, if you want to pick a question, I'm happy to answer it. Uh, it'll take me a while to read them otherwise. Okay. So is it okay if I give you two, three questions first and then Absolutely. you answer? And after Absolutely. that, we'll pick up other solutions. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Uh, so there is a question by Vijay Lakshmi Bara. Do you believe that women are inherently good? If not, then what are the sociological underpinnings that lead them to govern better? That is one question. Mm -hmm. There is another question by Alina Sebastian. If we look women as a diverse group in terms of their caste, class positions, political orientations, self-interest, etc., how would that inform the current discussion? Okay. Um, so, um, Vijay Lakshmi, um, thank you for your question. Um, it's, you know, it's not possible to take an essentialist position, obviously, to say women are somehow inherently good and men are inherently bad. Uh, 
I mean, there's, uh, I am not a social psychologist, but of course, uh, we know it's not nature, but nurture, which makes a difference. Um, uh, so um, uh, that's the kind of literature that one would uh, need to look at. What is true is that uh, there is a, there are a range of experiments, um, you know, where, which, which economists and others have done, uh, which show that women tend to be more cooperative you know, they, uh, and, and, they, uh, and they tend to resolve conflicts uh, faster and so on. So if you look at that literature, um, then you would say that uh, the group dynamics appears to work better when they have more women in the group. Now, the, um, the, uh, the question of, uh, so it is linked to um, your issue of morality. Why are women less corrupt? Why is it found? It's found not just in India. But also, if you look at the literature, there's uh, the study, um, recent study in Brazil, um, which finds that, um, and it could be a mix of things. Uh, it could be that uh, you know women have less opportunity. You know, if you look at social norms, then the access uh, of they don't have the same networks. And uh, one can argue that because of uh, the uh, the dissimilarity of networks, um, they are less in a position uh, or to be offered bribes. And that's also possible. There was a study by Anne-Marie Goetz uh, for Bangladesh, it was a long time ago, uh, where she talked about uh, the fact that there are the social norms which uh, reduce access to women leaders um, uh, would, uh, would make a difference uh, to uh, this issue of corruption and, and bribery. So the jury is out there, but the, but the evidence that we've seen that they accumulate fewer assets over time and so on is very much there. And I think I would encourage you to look at uh, the, some of the studies I've cited. The question of um, diversity in terms of class, caste positions, uh, um, etc. cetera, um, I did try, I have touched on that, as I had said that, um, of course, we do, people have multiple identities. Uh, the question is that, um, do we, uh, are we bound as women by those identities or not? Uh, because even within those identities, whether you take caste or race, you find that, that women are often much more disadvantaged. Domestic violence is an obvious thing that across classes and, and social contexts, you find that women face domestic violence. So what I'm suggesting is that there can be strategic alliances, there can be commonality of interests be between women, even if they are diverse on, uh, in terms of uh, class and, and caste and race for instance. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, I think politically that would, and, and we have examples of people coming together uh, strategically, uh, even if all the interests don't align. There's an interesting discussion about this also by Iris, uh, Iris Young, between Iris Young and, and some other feminist philosophers. Right, so, uh... I think let us pick up two more questions in the next round. Uh, one is by uh, Ekta Sheikh. How is the quality of women's participation among these local institutions measured? Sorry, uh, where is this? How is the quality of women's participation, women's participation among the local institutions measured? Mm -hmm. That is what. Then Rakesh Ganguly. Wouldn't it be critical to expand the gender question to include the LG, LGBTQ and A plus as integral to any all gender discourse? Thank you. Yes, I would agree with the second one. Um, absolutely. Uh, we, we need uh, much more uh, analysis uh, from that perspective as well. So I agree with that. On the first uh, question uh, was that how do you, how is participation measured in local institutions? Well, um, when I was doing my work on community forestry, I looked at uh, uh, three indicators of participation. Do they attend meetings? Do they speak up at meetings? And do, do they take leadership positions? So in, in that context, in the executive committee, you could be president, vice president, or treasurer and secretary. I mean, those were the four positions. Um, uh, and uh, the attendance, um, you know, there can be diverse ways. Uh, I actually uh, looked at, um, and with my research team, uh, looked at uh, the minutes of meetings. Um, and we went back, you know, they 
they keep uh, minutes, uh, you know, this was in India in Nepal, I looked at Gujarat and, and, uh, and Nepal, uh, three districts of Nepal, three districts of Gujarat. And if you go back many years and you can see um, where, what the meetings are and then um, who participated. You know, you go through the names, you, it's, it's a laborious process, uh, who attended meetings. Um, and uh, in terms of um, whether they speak up, um, or, or not has to be much more observational and that's more difficult. And then do they hold leadership positions? It is uh, fairly easy because you have, again, the history of who's been, how many women have been president, vice president, and you can go back several years as we did. Um, there's work by Vijinder Rao and Ban, um, uh, where they looked at some Southern states, where they attended a large number of Gram Sabha meetings and observed um, who attended and who actually spoke up. And that's one of the studies I refer to. Uh, um, so uh, it's uh, it, it is it, it it has to be carefully done, and it's laborious. One of the points I do make, uh, however, in gender and green governance, mm -hmm. that the fact that women don't speak doesn't mean they're not participating. So it's it's a it's a sort of social norm. I my observation that women when it when they agree, simply nod their heads. And they don't necessarily repeat what another woman has said, whereas men are much more vocal. So if a man has said it, the second one will also speak up and said, well, I agree or disagree. And women tend not to do that. So you could get undercounting of women speaking. I would see as a nod or a vigorous nod or a vigorous no as like almost like speaking. So I think there's a, a, a it, it's difficult to measure empirically, but there you are. Uh. Another uh, important question is from Lalita Ramdas. Hmm. What needs to be done through education and content of curriculum to bring the attitudinal change so necessary? Well, you know, I mean, this is this is one of those questions that how do you create gender stereotypes? At what age do you do it? Uh, and uh, it, it seems to me it's not just a curriculum issue. It's uh, children learn uh, gender roles long before they go to school. There's preschool. As you know, there's, uh, there's been experiments tried out in, uh, in Sweden and elsewhere uh, where they try and undermine, uh, you know, uh, mix up uh, the way in which we think of colors, pink for girls, blue for boys, uh, or which toys. Um, but what I'm saying is that uh, we have to think this through. It's very important, but it has to be um, not just in our school curriculum, which is important, uh, but also in preschool um, and uh, attitudes of, of parents. Um, how, how, what do children observe uh, if, when they see uh, the gender division of roles in the home? If the woman is always doing the cooking and cleaning and the man is sitting and watching TV and reading the newspaper, then that is um, a very powerful um, lesson that you can carry forward. So you have to change roles all the way along. Education is one of them. The curriculum is only one of them. As, as you know very well, uh, Lolly. Yeah. You know, the Pramod Kumar Chobe uh, wants to ask a question about the growth of effectiveness of participation over time, post-1993, from first gen generation of 1990s to fifth generation in 2020s. The growth of effectiveness of participation over time. Hmm. So this is one. And what, what exactly is the question, though? Uh, he wants to ask... He wants, he wants to uh, ask something about the growth of effectiveness of participation over time. Has participation uh, grown effectively over time? He want, he wants, his, his question is a bit uh, comparative. He, is there a difference between the first generation of 1990s and the uh, gener fifth generation of 2020s? Yes, I believe there has been uh, an improvement. There's been... Uh... Uh, there, uh, there are studies, uh, some including some of the ones that I referred to, where um, uh, women themselves, their performance improves as they gain experience, as we would uh, in any job. If you put men to a new job, uh, they will learn over time, and so with women. What is interesting is that in, in uh, one of these studies, uh, large studies by economists, uh, 
uh, group of economists shows that the perception of uh, the villagers towards male leaders changes um, over time and they begin to recognize they, were, they are much more skeptical about their capabilities earlier, but over time they begin to recognize uh, their capabilities. And I think some of this uh, also comes up that women are being, um, uh, are being uh, elected in non-reserve constituencies as well. Uh, a couple of uh, questions more. Is increased presence also effective in influencing the changing mindsets? I can only say yes, I believe so. Hmm. Um, and somebody uh, wants you to comment on something. The issue of representation is fundamentally a structural problem. Hmm. The pre-existing patriarchal values, views and attitude of men dominate the scene. Comment. Um, yes, it is structural uh, in, in so far as, uh, um, so, um, so the question is, what do you consider uh, structure? So, um, for instance, uh, certain. So, I would I would take a structure uh, both uh, the material context within which we, women operate, um, the uh, the uh, inequalities in the labor market, the inequalities in access to jobs, uh, gender wage gaps, the inequalities in access to property. Um, notwithstanding equality in law, uh, you find I you know I did a recent paper where I looked at. Um, uh, what proportion across, this was across nine states, what proportion uh, of uh, women in rural land owning households uh, own land and you found that uh, in only, uh, uh, you know, only 16% uh, of uh, households did they uh, own land only and, and on, they owned only 11% of the land. So there are structural, I think, embedded uh, economic inequalities um, which um, uh, we need to uh, deal with. The second is, uh, you can call it superstructure if you like, are the social norms. And the social norms that women um, are predominantly responsible for housework and childcare. Um, now, um, some many of you would know uh, that a large proportion, um, you know, there's been uh, work by feminist economists to point out how the, there's a whole parallel economy, the care economy, where um, the fact that women are predominantly responsible for childcare and housework, and then increasingly with aging, with elder care, um, means that it affects their um, ability to, um, uh, to work in the labor market on an equal basis. There's uh, interruptions of jobs, they have part-time work, um, and, and all this makes a difference to their also their lifetime earnings. Uh, so um, uh, similarly, the question of social norms that, you know, the restrictions on women's mobility, for instance. Now, some of this is social norms and some of this has to do with safety concerns. Uh, that women, um, uh, that they may be sexually harassed on the streets. We talked about sexual harassment in the workplace. But what about the millions of women who work in the fields and they feel unsafe? Um, so what I'm saying is, I agree with you that there are structural um, issues and we have to look at structure in, on both levels, not just about changing attitudes that we keep talking about, uh, but also the economic structures which uh, embed women at a, at, a, at a much more disadvantaged position. And here, therefore, I would say that um, when we talk about women's issues, we need to move beyond infrastructure, sanitation, health, pipe drinking water, uh, to the more economic questions. Why don't people's manifestos say we're going to give 50% of jobs to women? I'm not saying you need to you know, put quotas, but I'm merely saying that why don't we move to much more economic agendas in relation to um, empowering women um, as well. Now, uh, th th there is a talk about, you know, equal wage for equal work. I saw it in the Women's Manifesto, for instance, but what about jobs? What about property? So, um, so I'm expanding on why I'm agreeing with you, but I'm then expanding on the way we think about structure um, is very important. Uh. Let us take two more questions. Uh, one is of a general nature, and uh, the other one is probably in the is is particularly in the Indian context. The general one is, in your opinion, 
is struggling to gain equality in religion a better option or should we break away from religions and practices which discriminate against women that is what then would second you, one would you would you would you repeat this again i think it's okay a, in your opinion in your opinion is struggling to gain equality in religion a better option or should we break away from religions and practices which discriminate against women okay then uh, india specific question uh, how far women leaders could effectively negotiate with the panchayat level elites and caste dominance how far women leaders could effectively negotiate with the panchayat level elites and caste dominance so both very good questions um uh, and i'm not sure i have a complete answer to either um uh, i believe that you know for i would convert that first question into the india question uh, to say that look we have a constitution uh and um, and uh, the um, and there are there are serious inequalities in all religions um and people are selective they cherry pick they somebody picks some historic point others pick another historic point um and uh, so those conversations of interpreting religious texts there are scholars i'm not in a position to uh, enter that field but there are scholars who are doing that but i would say that the um, uh, struggle for women's rights should be based on uh, the constitutional guarantees of equality and uh, and we leave religion in the private realm but the uh, but um, and legally of course that's the direction in which you tend to move and i feel that that's important however having said that i know it's a very complex issue because in people's lives um, uh, religion and uh, faith and all these issues uh, matter and i don't think there can be a, a, a single answer but the direction in which it should move should be towards uh, greater equality and that's also towards greater humanity of equality of all human beings which is what i believe um the uh, the question of uh, elite is of course uh, uh, complex um, the profiles of many women uh, leaders at least at the village panchayat level has been that they don't always come from the most disadvantaged they tend to be more educated and and so on now i don't have a comprehensive list here of of their um, your profiles um, but uh, that is a that is one of the struggles that a woman panchayat uh, or a male panchayat uh, uh, pradhan um, would face if they came from a disadvantaged uh, class or caste position um, and um, uh, the um, so this is an this is something that has to be studied empirically on how you deal with elite i can give you an example however um, uh, that everything is not about elite capture so when i was doing my work on community forestry uh, often people would say well you can't community forestry groups can't um, be successful because uh, you'll have the uh, elite capture of the committees and i found that that was not necessarily the case and that was partly because um, the richest families in the village were not interested uh, in either protecting the forest or taking very much from it because they were not dependent on it so sometimes you find that uh, the kinds of uh, um, interventions that leaders can make may be so beneficial across the field or be or people might be so disinterested that that it won't ca cause the kind of conflict so if a woman pradhan is able to bring in a major road project or uh, or uh, pipe drinking water then that would uh, benefit all households uh, and i think that would be uh, that would be uh, her strength and her ability to uh, to um, uh, deal with uh, potential um, pressures from the elite uh we have already crossed over 15 minutes time but uh, in fact we have already uh, completed 18 minutes can we pick up one one or two more questions if that I'm, is okay with you i am absolutely okay yeah okay uh so there is one question by ranji topo violence against women is used as a tool to curb their access to institutions and their freedom how to investigate the different kinds of sexual violence intimate pa partner violence domestic violence while addressing their land inheritance rights 
how it affects their presentation and representation in labor force participation leadership? Well, you have a bunch of more than one question. I, I'm sure there are five questions there. There would be great dissertations for students um, to do. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think I can link all that up uh, in an answer. Uh, but what I can do um, uh, is um, uh, that uh, I'll share with you um, uh, concretely on research I did with a colleague, uh, Riddhi Panda on uh, the link uh, between domestic violence and women owning property. Uh, till then, um, the, much of the research had looked at women's economic status and, and domestic violence in terms of employment. And we brought in whether women own uh, land or house, which is immovable property in the context of Kerala. We looked at 500 randomly selected households in rural and urban um, areas. And uh, we found that um, women who owned land or house were significantly less um, likely to be subjected to physical violence. And this is in Kerala, which is a, a women seen as a women's friendly, friendly state. So the incidence of violence was 49% in households where the women own neither land or, nor house to 7% if they had both and something in between 17% if you had a land, 10% if you had a house. So the, uh, the, the, and then we control for every other aspect as well. If you look at that paper, um, there are two papers, one in world development, one in general of human development. Um, we, um, we control for other things uh, as well, uh, social support systems, um, uh, alcohol abuse, employment differences. And we, uh, we found that except for formal employment, uh, women uh, who were working in the informal sector or um, uh, had uh, seasonal jobs were actually more subject to violence. So there was a perverse effect, but there was no perverse effect with property. So I would say that the, uh, the, uh, as you look at more and more, there are a whole range of studies now which show that if women own property, it protects them from not just domestic violence, but also food insecurities uh, and, um, and, and, and many other um, welfare issues, uh, destitution, um, uh, extreme poverty, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Ahmed, uh, Bidyut Mohanty has been raising her hand. Uh, yes. so we, might, we might ask her to give a question. Thank you. Vina, it's an excellent uh, lecture. I really enjoyed. Uh, Thank you. But uh, I, have, you know, I have some queries regarding the women in panchayats. You know, what are the preconditions you conceive for the effective participation? I know the tribal area, the coastal area, or in terms of state, which state? So some. Um, some grassroots reality, if you can set light, that would be more meaningful. But in terms of general framework, I agree with you. Well, you know, there can be two kinds of studies. There can be very intensive field work studies, which have a great deal of value. And then uh, the other studies, which are uh, which cut across many states and which are uh, methodologically rigorous in order to establish that there are differences, there are causal differences. Uh, between uh, the, where if you have women pradans, it makes a difference to policy or to corruption. So both kinds of studies are, uh, are essential. Uh, and I wanted to share today this literature, body of literature by, uh, by economists. Uh, it's a small group, um, but uh, I think um, the uh, rigor of the methodology and the, and the scale of it uh, gives us uh, some robust results. Um, the questions you ask are also very important. And since you worked on panchayats yourself um, in, in great depth, I'm sure you are in a good position to answer, better position than me, certainly, to answer that particular question. Uh, there are at least 30, 35 more questions, but probably we'll have to stop here. Let's take one last one and we'll finish with it. Okay, okay. Uh, there was a very specific question. Uh, it, it's a very short question, focused very. Uh, in your view, what are three steps that the government should take that would lead to women empowerment effectively? <laughs> three steps. <laughs> um, uh, I would say uh, 
uh, focus uh, uh, particularly, you know, if we all have our own lists and I don't like uh, lists, but I would say that economic empowerment is extremely important. Uh, and um, the, the question of, for poor women, since uh, the vast proportion of women workers in India are still based in rural areas, their, their access to land uh, and agricultural land is extremely important, but along with that, to make that productive. Um, so you, when, when, you, when you talk about um, an asset, you also have to see, like land, you also have to see, do they have access to um, uh, irrigation? Do they have access to inputs? Do they ha have access to technology and information? Uh, there's a, it'll lead to a digital divide. Uh, it, it'll, you'll focus on a digital divide. So, um, so I think that's uh, very important. Um, access to um, jobs. Women want jobs, but of, and we need to plan for uh, jobs. But in planning for both of these, uh, you have to make sure that it's not just why is it that women want jobs, but they're not able to take them. So they want jobs closer to their workplaces. Uh, they want um, safety. They want hostels. Uh, so um, what I'm saying is that you pick any one of these issues and you'll find that in order to make that happen, there'll be a range of policies which need to go along with it. Uh, and the third would be really that child care is not women's responsibility alone. Child care is a joint responsibility of both parents and everything that the government could do from, from not just maternity leave, you need actually parental leave. Uh, and, and paternity leave, which, the, which, um, uh, which would make the space even uh, for uh, within the household. I think that's very important. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, let us now uh, request Professor Dubey for his presidential remarks, which would be followed by a vote of thanks. Over to Dubey, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh... Dr. Riyaz Zamad. Uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have really very little to add in my remarks. Uh, uh, but uh, since I had this occasion, uh, I would like to just uh, highlight a few, few points. Firstly, I would uh, 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 join. Uh, others and you particularly in uh, uh, paying our great respect and, and expressing our great appreciation uh, to Professor Vera Grewal for uh, agreeing to deliver this lecture and uh, uh, fully uh, coming up uh, to our expression in the lecture that she has uh, delivered. Uh, I think it has been a lesson uh, for the audience here and uh, for the uh, people at large who uh, would be uh, made hear this lecture in different uh, uh, forms of uh, uh, media uh, in the coming days. Uh, I, uh, Professor Agarwal, had uh, has had. Uh, a very, very soft corner for the Council for Social Development. And that's understandably because of our association with, his, with the Council uh, in the early part of our career. Uh, and uh, uh, I have not uh, uh, seen her uh, turning down any request that uh, I have made to her for uh, <coughs> Uh, joining uh, a committee that we have set up for uh, uh, contributing to any projects that we have and uh, uh, for uh, uh, coming to our platform and sharing her views with us. And I'm really most grateful to her for this. Uh, Dr. Agarwal uh, is a uh, 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 you know, her, her, uh, she's basically an, an econom, economist, uh, but uh, uh, she has pursued uh, much wider uh, interests and issues. And she has, she is a pioneer in gender study, 
she's also one of the earliest who has made a uh, very far-reaching contribution to the understanding of the rural economy and agrarian problems. Uh, she basically has been working on the cutting edges of a variety of dis disciplines, uh, basically economics, but also going to law, to history, to sociology. Uh, and uh, uh, she has produced uh, uh, results which were uh, outcomes in the form of uh, papers, uh, uh, books, uh, uh, which uh, uh, were the first of their kind when they, they were published. And they are still remembered as such even now. Uh, she is, uh, uh, her, her reputation spreads very wide, both nationally and internationally. Uh, and uh, I think Professor uh, Riyaz Ahmad uh, was very uh, lyrical uh, as, as it was proper to be in describing her uh, achievements and her contributions in the in the very in the in the different fields. I think uh, uh, about her lecture, I have uh, one or two points to raise. Uh, one of them is that uh, 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 does the uh, very presence uh, of uh, uh, women. Uh, uh, serve uh, the cause of women in the country. Presence of women in in, legisl in, in legislative bodies and other bodies. And uh, my view is that uh, uh, various studies that she has drawn upon and what a massive empirical, uh, you know, richness uh, she has brought uh, to the uh, to, to to her lecture. Uh, uh, various studies may uh, show that uh, uh, they advance, uh, uh, their presence advances the causes of women. Uh, but uh, is the presence alone which advances the causes of women? Are not there other socioeconomic factors which op operate? Uh, are not there other actions and policies? apart from what is legislated in legislative bodies that are important. Implementation bodies, the bodies which monitor, etc. So this is the uh, first point I would like to make. The second point that I would like to make is that uh, 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 how far special measures for women uh, which are traditionally recognized uh, can uh, best serves uh, their interest or interest of the of the nation. Uh, and I will here go to the field of uh, uh, school education, of which I have some knowledge and some experience. And uh, as a special measures uh, in school education sphere, it is suggested that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, there should be a special scholarship for them, there should be hostels for them, there should be, uh, you know, uh, transport for them. Uh, many of these state governments, uh, I think one of them who uh, became very uh, popular in this regard, uh, have uh, uh, tried to serve their interests uh, by providing bicycles for them to uh, commute to their schools. Uh, my view is that uh, uh, these special measures uh, uh, are more in the nature of uh, tokens. Uh, they leave their main problem untouched. Uh, they are a very ready made, you know, uh, instrument for political leaders to demonstrate uh, what, how much they are doing uh, for, for women. Uh, 
the problem in East Asia is so vast that uh, what is provided by way of social measures gives the only a fragment of that problem, uh, and uh, it is very much politicized. Uh, whatever little is done, I mean, and it has a, uh, the debilitating effect of uh, sidetracking from the main objective and from the main goal. I mean, for example, in the field of school education, uh, you have the problem of uh, universalization, uh, which is for both. Uh, boy, boy and girls. Uh, you had the application of norms, uh, which is also uh, applicable to all universally. Now, if these norms are applied universally, both to uh, boys and girls, and uh, implemented within a time frame, then you would not need these special measures. I mean. Uh, hostels for, uh, especially for women, it is not hard of uh, in, in school education, it is not hard of in Western countries, which have reached the goal of the universalization of education. And if you follow the norm of providing a school, uh, say per kilometer from the distance from the habitation of the uh, student, then what do you need a hostel for? So, I mean, you know, these are as I said, just uh, uh, kind of excuses to show that there is a progress and they are doing something. But what really needs to be done is a, such a huge dimension that uh, for political reasons, for lack of political will, governments do not want to take them squarely. They scut around it. And these special measures are the rules by which they start. Uh, so uh, and that doesn't mean that there is no need for special measures, but we should recognize its uh, limitations, the abuses to which it can be put. Uh, uh, they can be adopted as supplementary uh, measures uh, till uh, the broader goal of universalization, applying norms across the board are achieved. But there cannot be a substitute for that. So this is the one point I would like to make. And the other point is a, has been raised in some of the questions asked from the floor, is that uh, are women uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, more peace loving uh, than men? Are they less prone to violence than men? Uh, are uh, do they have a greater uh, sense of uh, social justice uh, equity than men? Do they necessarily attach uh, higher priorities to the issues which really uh, constitute the crux of the problem of the country, like health, education, etc.? And uh, uh, my, I mean, she has. Uh, drawn upon a huge number of studies done from all over the world to demonstrate that uh, uh, they, uh, they are uh, and they have proved to be in specific cases. But again, I would say that uh, the outcome of this study, the final result, has been influenced also by a variety of other factors, rather than the factor of uh, there being men or, 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 or women. And uh, I would therefore uh, say that uh, the, uh, 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 this should be uh, more carefully uh, used and uh, 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 not uh, uh, really kind of uh, taken as, uh, as truth uh, because they have been uh, scientifically arrived at based on studies uh, following rigorous uh, technique and uh, rigorous uh, uh, logic and, and arguments. So I think that uh, uh, these are the, the couple of remarks I would like to make. I would not extend this session uh, very much longer. 
and with this uh, with uh, uh, my uh, most grateful uh, thanks to professor bina majdar again uh, i conclude Agarwal. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Th I, thank, yeah. I, I know we have to have a word of thanks, but I, I wanted to thank uh, Professor Dubey for his comments. Um, I think uh, he has also laid the ground for further debate um, uh, uh, because uh, uh, some of those issues, uh, you're right, are uh, subject to further research and some of, of what you said um, could also be, uh, as we tend to say, arguably. Uh, so thank you for, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, and for that wonderful uh, list of, uh, of questions, which, are, which I believe will be sent to me. And if you would like to write to me um, for anything that's a burning question, I'd be very happy to address it. And th thank you, Professor Dube, uh, Professor Nanda, Professor Monte, and of course, Professor Ahmed and uh, Dr. Kalra. Now we have a vote of thanks yes. to, be, to, to be proposed by uh, uh, Nitu. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. So <coughs> thank you, Professor uh, Bina Agarwal, for a very stimulating and interesting lecture on gender presence and representation. So women empowerment, uh, according to me, is, uh, you know, requires uh, constant discourse for continuous development of the society as a whole. I would like to extend my thanks to Professor uh, Mukchand Dubey, Professor Riaz Ahmad, Professor Nityananda, Professor Mohanty, and Professor Vidyut, and everyone associated with Social Change Journal and the CSD team. Uh, it has been a pleasure at SAGE to collaborate with Social uh, CSD uh, for the journal Social Change. The association between SAGE and CSD is more than a decade old. Uh, the Social Change Journals publishes on the contemporary topics varying from gender equality, women issues, sexual harassment, education, domestic violence, and other social issues. Besides, the journal has also published wealth of articles on COVID impact on the society uh, during the pandemic time. The paper published by late Professor Vinay Kumar Shivastava on title Anatomy of Stigma, Understanding COVID-19 is amongst the top five most readable articles of social change. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic posed many challenges uh, impacting the society. During the unprecedented time, we successfully navigated through another difficult year with CSD for uninterrupted publication of social change. The accomplishment of social change journal further contributing to the journal credibility our social change turned into a legacy of uh, uh, 50 years in 2020. And social change got enlisted in Scopus and uh, uh, got UGC accreditation in, in the year 2020 itself. The journal has also recorded a very significant increase in the readership of the, around the world in 2020 and in 2021 as well. The total readership count is approximately 80,000, which is a very good uh, raise in the readership of the journal. So with this, I am uh, thankful to all the participants and everyone from CSD for coming here and attending the annual lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone.